Yeah, fantastic. So hi, everyone. As it uh, has been said, uh, I'm Kirill from the C Lab at Oxford Uni. And today I'm going to talk about the general topic of uh, resource aware synthetic biology. So when I say synthetic biology, I simply mean the act of engineering cells with useful new functionalities. And usually we do that by adding new synthetic genes to cells. But then uh, when we uh, have uh, genes uh, in a cell, well, first of all, they are read uh, to produce uh, mRNA molecules. Uh, and then these mRNA molecules are translated into proteins, which in most cases are the molecules that enact all these uh, new functions like biosensing, catalysis of uh, relevant biological reactions, and also regulation of other genes. But both when we uh, transcribe DNAs into mRNAs and then translate mRNAs into proteins, we need molecular resources like RNA polymerases and- Sorry, Kirill, we, we, we lost you for- uh, I think it's on my end. Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, I think it's on your end. I, I he's on your fine. Sorry, sorry about that. Okay, so every everything good. Uh, nothing uh, flickered out. Good. So yeah, when we have uh, this kind of transcription translation, we need molecular resources like RNA polymerases and uh, ribosomes. Uh, so when we have several genes in a cell, and by definition, a cell is a collection of more than one gene. Uh, we have uh, different genes competing for the same limited amount of these uh, shared resources, which introduces a whole new layer of interactions and complexity to biological systems, and uh, also makes them behave in a non-modular fashion. And while this applies to the expression of genes and production of proteins, the same kind of patterns can be seen all across uh, the cell. For example, we know that in some CRISPR interference uh, gene regulation mechanisms, we have uh, the shared pool of Cas9 moieties, uh, which need to be bound by synthetic uh, single binder RNAs in order to bind their DNA targets. And the same, we uh, may need some uh, chaperone proteins to be attached uh, to small RNAs before they can start regulating their target mRNAs. So we really can see that this kind of phenomena can be observed uh, across uh, different biological systems and their consequences can be quite dire. So for example, in a wonderful experimental study published uh, a while ago, a simple cascade of two genes activating uh, each other uh, had an experimentally observed behavior be completely different uh, than the one expected uh, based on the assumptions of modularity and consistent behavior performance of uh, different uh, circuit components uh, due to resource competition. So today I'm gonna spend time on uh, describing how mathematical modeling can help us address the challenges that arise from resource competition in different biological systems. First, I'm gonna talk about competition for shared ribosomes in gene expression. First, proposing uh, a cell uh, model for Escherichia coli bacteria, which allows to incorporate resource competition considerations into circuit design. And then I'll walk through a case study of uh, using this model to design some novel circuit aimed at combating uh, the effects of resource competition on cell populations. And then after that, I'm going to mention uh, the uh, competition for RNA chaperone proteins in small RNA regulation and how we stumbled upon it in one of our experiments back in Steel Lab. So starting with uh, the cell uh, model part of the talk. As I told you, when we have synthetic genes in the cell, they will compete for shared resources between themselves and with other uh, native genes already present in the host cell before the synthetic genes were introduced. But that's not all, because, well, ribosomes uh, of, the cells, uh, of the cell, they are themselves product uh, of native gene expression. So through this competition, synthetic genes also uh, manipulate the overall ribosome availability. And then because the protein density in a cell stays roughly consistent uh, over time, uh, the rate of protein production by ribosomes is coupled to the rate of protein dilution due to host cell growth. But that's not all, because besides this burden effects on host cell growth, we also have growth feedback, because host cell growth and this dilution of proteins is one of the primary mechanisms for removing synthetic proteins 
from the system. And besides this burden interaction, we also should consider the toxicity of synthetic gene expression, which can further influence cell dynamics. But even that is not all, because the cell doesn't just uh, sit by and passively watch as its resource availability changes. Instead, it has a very intricate system of uh, signaling uh, that allows it to optimize its growth for a particular set of environmental conditions, uh, mostly powered by the PTGPP signaling molecule. And this kind of optimal resource allocation for growth uh, can be captured by the empirical observations uh, that we can make. Uh, for example, we know that when we increase the quality of nutrients in the culture medium, uh, the ribosome uh, abundance in a cell will be increased. But this trend becomes reversed when we start adding ribosome inhibiting antibiotics uh, to the culture medium. So all this to say, uh, these kind of interactions, they look quite complicated and we'd like to somehow incorporate them without losing our mind over it. Luckily, to this end, we can use mathematical models uh, of resource away gene expression. But mathematical models, they exist on a whole spectrum of complexity. On one hand, all of these interactions that I've been droning on about can be just ignored uh, to define very simple and understandable uh, differential equations which would outline the dynamics of mRNA and protein concentrations. But of course, as we have seen in an experimental example, they may be often very inaccurate and simply fail to predict what's going to happen in real life. Then some of these growth burden relations that we have observed, for example, the growth laws with uh, ribosome abundance increasing as we increase the nutritiousness of the medium, can be defined as simple empirical relations uh, that you bake into your simple uh, ODE uh, models. In this case, you get a system that's still simple and still quite understandable, but because all, all of these relationships uh, are defined without any mechanistic understanding of how they arrive, uh, arise, we'll basically get a somewhat arbitrary definition of how they work and have no explanation of how the effects of burden actually arise. On the whole other end of the complexity spectrum, we have whole cell models, which try to comprehensively model every single reaction that goes on in the cell. But with thousands of variables, they can be quite hard to understand and even more expensive and difficult to parameterize and then to simulate. And because of our current imperfect understanding of cell biology, these are still not actually whole cell models. For example, for the Escherichia coli bacterium, I think under a half of all genes actually present in the cell are currently considered by whole cell models. Uh, but occupying a middle ground between these extremes of the complexity spectrum, we have coarse grain cell models, which try to simplify uh, the dynamics of happening in, in the cell or what's happening in the cell by grouping different variables into lumped uh, variables which describe average dynamics of uh, thousands of variables at a time. And these simplifications and abstractions allow us to maintain relative simplicity uh, and uh, make simulations quite cheap to run. But at the same time, because we actually do take time to represent what's going on in the cell in general, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, emergence of burden effects is captured mechanistically. But there is a caveat, and this caveat is that we need to choose our modeling assumptions quite carefully. Because of course, when we start abstracting different interactions, in some scenarios, we will abstract a very important uh, signaling mechanism, for example, and therefore get inaccurate predictions. So we need to make sure that the simplifications uh, that we make, uh, they are not harming the model's predictive potential in relevant uh, scenarios for, deploy for the deployment of biotechnologies. So with this in mind, what are our requirements for a coarse grain cell model? First of all, we'd like to be able to model the expression of a synthetic gene circuit based on its physiological parameters uh, to maintain a clear link uh, between the model and uh, real life. At the same time, we want to have a somewhat realistic uh, representation of the host physiology and also its growth uh, regulation mechanisms, uh, for example, by this PPGPP molecule I've talked about in uh, relevant uh, culturing settings, that is usually exponential growth with quite high nutritiousness of the medium, if we're talking about industrial applications and bioreactors. But also we need to make sure that we're capturing the synthetic gene interactions among themselves and with the host cell, 
And then it goes both direct interactions that we engineer into the circuit and the indirect resource competition interactions. At the same time, we would really like to keep minimum complexity of the model and if possible, enable some analytical derivations uh, so as to avoid having to simulate a circuit's performance for a given parameter combination every single time the parameters are adjusted and have some kind of a bigger picture view of what's going on in the cell. So with these uh, criteria in mind, we defined a coarse-grained uh, resource-aware model for the Escherichia coli cells. And all of the thousands of genes of the cell we basically group into three possible classes. One of them is ribosomal genes, uh, which are responsible simply for ribosome synthesis. Then we have metabolic genes, which are responsible for metabolism and the synthesis of amino cell tRNAs, that is precursors for protein synthesis. And all other genes are housekeeping genes, uh, as we call this class. And uh, due to our modeling assumptions, we can avoid modeling them explicitly, which further simplifies our model. So for both uh, explicitly considered gene classes, that is ribosomal and metabolic genes, we model their mRNA and protein abundances, uh, incorporating the transcription regulation mechanisms present in the cell uh, with a bird's eye view, and then uh, explicitly having the translation be dependent on resource competition. And because we know that uh, the PGPP signaling enabling the regulation of cell growth uh, is dependent on the ratio between the free and amino acylated uh, tRNA levels, we also uh, model these variables. And in the end, we get a model that uh, still quite reliably reproduces uh, the growth phenomena observed experimentally. So these kind of trends with increasing uh, the nutrition of the medium and increasing the antibiotic uh, concentration, they are maintained by our model. Uh, we can also see that the levels of this PPGPP signaling molecule are captured quite well uh, by our model too. But besides these steady state uh, predictions uh, for the cell's metabolism, we can also see that we can have quite realistic dynamic predictions, uh, for example, for the nutrient upshift uh, dynamics uh, that may be experienced by bacterial cells when we add new uh, sources of nutrition to the medium and increase its uh, nutritiousness. Great, so we have something that captures the host cell's physiology quite well. How does it help us with synthetic gene circuit design? Well, first of all, uh, you can just simulate uh, their performance by appending the relevant ODEs, that is an ODE for each synthetic gene's uh, mRNA and protein levels to the cell model. Uh, and as an example of that, we can, for example, consider the case of a T7 RNA polymerase that transcribes its uh, own gene. And it has been shown experimentally that depending on the initial condition, it can have two possible stable steady states, which is what indeed we see in uh, our model simulations, where starting with a bit of T7 RNA polymerases, uh, lambdas in a region with high polymerase expression. But if we start at zero concentration, then we have low expression uh, instead. Uh, but this is still just simulation. Uh, how can we have some finer view of how circuit parameters affect the dynamics of a circuit? Well, uh, we can uh, study uh, circuit performance using some numeric techniques. For example, control-based continuation uh, can allow us to estimate the effect of protein toxicity on the possible steady states of the system. Now, control-based continuation is a conceptually quite simple technique. So you have our model, uh, which is the resource of cell model with T7 RNA polymerase expression, and a controller which can uh, change the parameters fed into this models. And we also have a sequence of reference steady states that we would like to achieve. Uh, and then based on this reference, the controller adjusts uh, the model parameters uh, in order to drive uh, the model to a given reference steady state. Once a reference steady state uh, has been achieved, then we move on to the next reference state in the list uh, and uh, proceed with this operation again. So for toxicity and the states of this uh, T7 RNA polymerase circuits, we can have a control-based continuation uh, simulation, which will allow us to reconstruct the bifurcation diagram uh, showing how different levels of RNA polymerase toxicity correspond to different possible steady states uh, concentrations of uh, T7 RNA polymerase. 
And what's great about control-based continuation is that even formerly unstable equilibria observed in the system, they are being stabilized uh, by our control feedback, and therefore both stable and unstable uh, equilibria are being retrieved. Still, these are all numerical techniques, and I promised some analytical derivations for you. Well, here they are. Uh, in general, we can try and derive the relations between the synthetic gene expression and the growth of the host cell that has the synthetic genes. So we have managed to derive two different laws uh, for uh, this kind of relationship. If we consider constant parameters like synthetic promoter strings and gene copy numbers or ribosome binding sequence strings of synthetic genes, then we have a Hill repression function representing uh, the dependence of growth rate on these parameters. But if we instead look at the end product of synthetic gene expression, that is the abundance of synthetic proteins, this relationship becomes linear and also matches experimental data quite well. And that's a very important distinction because previously, if we had no mechanistic understanding of how these relations occur, basically people have been seeing either one trend or another emerge. And overall, they were, they've been quite confused on which law to use in their kind of models. But in our case, uh, we have shown that there is actually, that both of these uh, relations are actually true uh, and offer them a reconciling explanation. All right, so besides just using the uh, differential equations to make some derivations, you can also use our model for simulations. And to this end, we have uh, released uh, model distributions both in MATLAB, in pure Python, and in Python enabled with the uh, JAX uh, package for parallel computation. And all these implementations allow you to run both deterministic and stochastic simulations of, of arbitrary gene circuits according to a certain template. And the most interesting case, uh, at least in my opinion, is the JAX implementation. Because the JAX package allows you to uh, run these simulations on the GPU of a computer. And thus, you can run uh, different stochastic trajectories or deterministic trajectories as well in parallel with superior scaling uh, compared to the MATLAB or pure Python cases. Okay, so far, uh, we have kind of argued that competition for ribosomes indeed does affect the behavior of cells and synthetic gene circuits uh, hosted by these cells. And we have proposed a coarse grain cell model, which would allow to capture these effects quite well and also predict the dynamics and equilibria for the relevant variables pertaining to the cell state and the state of a synthetic circuit. And also by keeping this uh, coarse grain model simple, we have uh, derived some new analytical relations which uh, provide us with new insights about the relationship between synthetic gene expression and cell growth. Now let's move on to use uh, this kind of model for a more complicated case of circuit design. In particular, let's focus on the problem of mutation spread. So as I have told you, synthetic genes, they impose a burden on the cell and slow down cell growth. So when the synthetic genes are mutated, we have a mutant cell which grows faster. So eventually mutant cells dividing faster will outgrow and outcompete and displace engineered cells from the population. And this of course is a major limiting factor for the productivity and functional lifespan of engineered uh, cell populations. Uh, of course, some uh, prior techniques like overlapping synthetic genes with genes essential for cell growth, they have been proposed, but all these uh, need to be tailored and re-implemented in DNA for each particular applications. So we could really benefit from a strategy that would be tunable and reusable across different applications with minimal changes. And to this end, we propose a Punisher circuit, which primarily consists of a switch gene, which upon uh, chemical induction uh, can act as a transcription activating factor, which promotes its own synthesis. Co-expressed with it is an integrase, uh, where, which uh, when it reaches a sufficient concentration can excise uh, from the cell's genome or from a plasmid an essential gene for cell growth, and therefore disable this kind of essential gene expression. We also have uh, the protease, which creates uh, the switch protein to tune the dynamics uh, of uh, the circuit. And I'll uh, spend more time explaining that a bit later. But what's important is that the expression of all these genes is naturally dependent on the availability of ribosomes in the cell. So 
when we have our punisher circuit present in the cell alongside some kind of other synthetic uh, burdens and gene, first, we have the cell experiencing quite a lot of burden and therefore not growing all that fast. But when these burdensome synthetic gene uh, is mutated, then we suddenly have more ribosomes available for synthesizing all kinds of proteins and the cell growth increases. But so does the expression of the integrase, which now becomes capable of excising an essential cell gene, an essential gene. For example, this essential gene can be responsible for antibiotic resistance. So with this essential gene uh, excised, you have much more uh, effect of antibiotic on cell metabolism, and therefore the cell will be punished by having its growth reduced by antibiotic action. This is what you can see in the simulated trajectory on the right, where first a mutation causes an uptick in the growth rate, but once the integrase catches up with it uh, and uh, disables uh, the expression of the antibiotic resistance gene chlorophenicol acetyl transferase, for example, we see a plummeting of uh, cell growth. Okay, so far so good. I have explained to you how the circuit is supposed to function, but then how, when, and why would the integrase expression be so upregulated uh, when burden is reduced? And how can we choose the relevant design parameters for the circuit to make sure that it functions correctly in a given application? Well, we can use our post-grade resource aware cell model to find out. So by making some analytical derivations, we can define the burden imposed on the cell uh, as a blunt parameter, which combines the concentration, the promoter strength, and the ribosome binding sequence strength of a given synthetic gene. And then we can look at the rates of uh, the switch uh, gene transcription to see which kind of equilibria are possible for the Punisher circuit. Uh, and in particular, we can have the real transcription rate uh, that takes place, and that's defined by the biochemical interactions between the switch uh, protein uh, as a transcription activator factor uh, and uh, its promoted DNA. But we can also use uh, our cell model to rearrange its term and define the required transcription rate that we need in order to maintain a given switch protein concentration for a given set of environmental conditions and for a given burden experienced by the cell. And equilibria for the financial circuit are only achieved when these two transcription rates uh, for the switch protein actually coincide. Moreover, if the required uh, transcription rate is higher than the real one, then naturally uh, the switch protein concentration will be decreasing. But when conversely, the real transcription rates uh, exceed uh, the necessary value, then we'll have the switch protein concentration increase. So when burden is, a, is sufficiently high, uh, we can see that a low expression equilibrium with a switch uh, gene transcription and uh, by extension, the transcription rate of the integrase gene being quite low. But as burden is reduced, we are stuck with just a single high expression equilibrium. So when burdensome synthetic circuitry is mutated, the punisher will transition from a low expression state to a high expression state, which will dramatically upregulate the expression of switch and integrase genes. Uh, so uh, we can also see by looking at transcription rates uh, that the threshold uh, for this kind of bifurcation and switching on of the punisher circuit can be determined by changing the level of a chemical inducer in the cell culture medium. Uh, without needing any kind of genetic changes like amending the promoter strength uh, or the ribosome binding sequence strength or anything of the sort. So if we want to reuse our punisher circuit in a new application, and we can see that no switching occurs when the synthetic genes of interest are mutated, we simply need to change uh, the chemical induction of the circuit to position uh, the switching threshold in a relevant range and then uh, the circuit will start working again. Uh, and this does not require any kind of genetic modifications, as I say. But this is only half of the problem, because besides knowing whether uh, the punisher will be switched on, we're interested in how fast uh, the punisher will switch on as well. Luckily, we know that the dynamics of biological systems are primarily defined by the rate of removal of uh, molecules from the system, which in our case is uh, facilitated by the synthetic protease uh, that uh, degrades uh, the switch uh, proteins. 
then uh, by looking at the transcription rates, the real and the required values, we can see that amending the concentration of the protease can change uh, the time taken by the punisher to be switched on. But if we, at the same time, readjust uh, the concentration of a chemical inducer uh, in the culture medium, then the carefully tuned swishing threshold will remain the same. So all this is good, but let's consider a real life example uh, to see how this will work. For example, let's consider a cell that hosts uh, two uh, toggle switch circuits. Uh, and uh, use the punisher to prevent uh, the growth of cells in which these circuits are mutated. So a toggle switch is a very simple memory circuit where one gene is highly expressed and the other is repressed by it. But their fortunes may be reversed upon a transient inducer pulse, a pulse of, indu of chemical inducer concentrations in the medium, which by changing its state, uh, the toggle switch recalls and allows to memorize. So if we just reuse the parameters uh, for the case of retaining one synthetic gene, we can see that even when both uh, genes of the toggle switch are mutated, we still see no switching on over the punisher, which is bad. But this simply means that we need to readjust the chemical inducer concentration without making any genetic changes. And Kazam, we now have a circuit that is switched on by synthetic gene mutations. But at the same time, this kind of switching uh, of a toggle switch uh, triggered by transient uh, inducer uh, pulses also is associated with a temporary reduction in burden experienced by the cell. And this temporary reduction does trigger the punisher as well. So what we need to do now is to slow down the reaction time of the punisher by readjusting the protease expression to make sure uh, that these transient uh, pulses are insufficient to make the punisher be switched on irreversibly. So guided by our second relation, uh, we readjust the protease level and the chemical induction to get the circuit which correctly disables mutant cell growth, but not the growth of uh, perfectly uh, genetically intact cells, which simply may experience a switching of, of the toggle. All these are single cell effects uh, of the punisher, and we're eventually interested in the genetic stability of cell populations. Uh, well, to this end, we can model the population of cells in a bioreactor. And because in a bioreactor, we usually have uh, billions of cells, considering the, considering the dynamics of every single cell is simply unsustainable. So we need to cause grain the population a bit and uh, treat as uh, model variables the numbers of cells in a given genetic state, that is, uh, with a given set of synthetic genes either being functional or non-functional, and uh, given states of the punisher. So either it's in a low expression equilibrium being turned off, or it's in a high expression equilibrium, so it's being switched on, or there is no uh, switch and integrase expression, for example, when the relevant genes are mutated. Now, such cell models have been proposed before, but the problem has been that they usually are parameterized with arbitrary values, and you just look at them and say, okay, this kind of looks the same as uh, some small scale uh, simulations uh, with uh, whole cell modeling uh, that we have run. But we instead uh, have characterized a, a preset uh, framework for using our single cell uh, simulations to parameterize the rates of transitions between different states uh, using both deterministic uh, steady state uh, retrieval to see the activity of an integrase in a given state and the cell growth rate, but also uh, using stochastic cell model simulations on the GPU to gauge the rates of transition uh, between different states over the punisher. And with these stochastic simulations, we can incorporate not only uh, the correct triggering of the punisher by synthetic gene mutation, but also false positive switching, which happens simply due to the, uh, due to the stochasticity of uh, gene expression. And in the end, we can see that indeed, for a wide range of uh, possible synthetic gene mutation rates, the punisher can more than double the yields and the uh, time for which synthetic circuitry remains functional uh, in a cell population in a bioreactors. Now, of course, with the punisher still assumed to be mutable, 
uh, we still have a finite uh, time over which uh, the population become functional. But the catch is now we need two mutations to be accumulated in a given order uh, for the mutants to gain a growth advantage. Because before it was enough to simply get rid of a burdensome gene and Kazan, you now grow faster. But now if you do that, then the punisher will penalize you and uh, make you lose antibiotic resistance, which means that you start growing slow. So instead, you first need to get rid of the punisher, and then uh, this punisher-less cell has to mutate again to get rid of the burdensome gene, uh, which uh, gives us uh, this time advantage. Okay, so in this case study, we have shown how coarse grained resource-aware cell models can help with designing biomolecular controllers uh, with quite unorthodox effects, uh, but also more broadly, we have seen how leveraging resource competition, for example, in our case, the dependence of the financial state on the burden can actually help us mitigate some of the unwanted effects of resource competition, like mutation spread. So finally, for a bit of change of scenery, let's consider competition for RNA chaperone proteins. And this is an ongoing pro uh, project in our lab, together with uh, Scott and Ola, who I believe is present in this very audience. Uh, and this started with a very simple uh, small RNA circuit being characterized in a bioreactor. So what we had is simply an EGFB synthetic gene uh, whose Translation from mRNA to protein was meant to be uh, interfered with by a synthetic sRNA. Uh, but at the same time, we had completely unrelatedly a CYRFP protein, also synthetic, being expressed in the cell. No interaction was intended uh, between uh, EGFP and CYRFP or between the synthetic uh, small RNA and the CYRFP protein. Still, when we induce the synthetic sRNA, we saw a huge uptick in CYRFP expression. And what was even more interesting is that when we replaced CYRFP with M scarlet, then no such effect uh, was observed. Uh, and in the same vein, when we repeated the experiment, not in a bioreactor, but in a plate reader, the behavior was also not reproduced. So all this is quite puzzling, but we believe that resource competition can be quite a plausible explanation. So imagine that the uh, Escherichia coli genome has some kind of native small RNA, which can off-target by chance downregulate the expression of uh, psi RFP. So to do that, it needs some chaperone proteins from a shared pool present in the Escherichia coli cells. Now, when we introduce a synthetic uh, small RNA, then it siphons off some of this free resource for its own needs. And therefore, the availability of chaperone proteins for decreasing CYRFP expression is reduced. We also know uh, that uh, in the plate reader, the cells are in late exponential or even stationary phase. And in this kind of uh, cell states, uh, there is much more HFQ chaperone proteins in the cell compared to the early exponential state uh, that the cells experience in the bioreactor. So in order to see whether this explanation is even plausible, we define a simple resource competition model and indeed show that positively our predictions uh, with the model can match uh, our observations in a bioreactor. Uh, and when we increase the availability of the chaperone proteins to mimic uh, these uh, kind of setup in a plate reader, we also see that not much else is uh, going on in the cell as we have seen experimentally. So uh, besides just having an initial validation of our hypothesis, we can also use this kind of models to design some experiments for further validating uh, our assumptions. In particular, we have uh, predicted using models uh, that decreasing the synthetic uh, small RNA's HFQ affinity should mitigate the upregulation uh, uh, observed in a bioreactor. And indeed, when we mutagenized uh, the small RNA's HFQ binding site, uh, we have uh, found that experimentally, the CYRFP expression is not upregulated very much, if at all, which is uh, concordant with our model predictions uh, as well. So to summarize, we have reason that resource competition can produce very unexpected phenomena in a wide range of experimental systems, like in our small RNA uh, circuit. 
at the same time, using resource aware models uh, can allow us to watch if an explanation is feasible in the first place, and then it can guide the design of validation experiments, which will hopefully allow us to have a better understanding of what's going on in the cell. Uh, so that's kind of has been my work so far, but there are some future steps uh, that I'd like to share with you briefly. And one promising direction is starting to use resource aware cell modeling for designing semicellular controllers. For example, uh, I have described a control based continuation techniques for gauging the parameter dependence uh, of uh, a circuit's behavior uh, in the cell. So, using uh, a mother machine setup where we have a microfluidic uh, chamber with individual cells being placed uh, at the bottom of each trench we can observe and manipulate gene expression in each individual cell, which provides a perfect match for our single cell resource aware models uh, that we have, and hopefully will allow us to see if uh, the control-based continuation method can be applied uh, to studying the dependence of uh, synthetic uh, circuits on burden in vivo. Also, we're currently carrying out more validation experiments for HFQ competition hypothesis that, have, uh, that I has, have applied before. And once we have sufficient evidence for that, we'll probably look at the effects of HFQ competition on other RNA-based uh, circuits. For example, we can uh, use our model to uh, predict and modify models for other synthetic gene circuits uh, that leverage uh, small RNAs and see whether this introduces some kind of new dynamics which we have not seen before. But also just generally, I'm really interested in exploring resource competition in new synthetic biology setups. And as I have said, you can never really know uh, when that's going to uh, pop up, but there are some signs to look out for. So if you see that when you have characterized gene circuit components in isolation and they behave one way, but when you combine them together to make a whole circuit, they start behaving differently, it's likely that you're dealing with a resource competition. If you see that host cell growth is significantly affected by the introduction of synthetic gene expression, then it's very likely that resource competition uh, will be very uh, relevant for your circuit design. And vice versa, if you see that, uh, for example, as in the case of small RNA circuitry, the circuit's performance is heavily dependent on the state of the host cell, for example, whether it's in exponential uh, growth phase or it's in stationary growth phase and has different resource abundances, then resource competition can be quite relevant as well. So now this is really it. Huge thanks to uh, my collaborators in Stan Group, uh, who mostly have been developing the resource aware cell model with me, and also to some of my collaborators in C Lab, together with whom I'm doing the small RNA based project, uh, the small RNA project, and the Punisher circuit development. And yeah, below you can also see some of the links to my uh, cell modeling work, and I'll be really excited to hear uh, some of your questions both now and over email unless I'm comfortable for you.